Hello there everybody and welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. In this video, we'll be talking about Christoller Central Place Theory and how it can be used to actually locate where we should put our services within society. So this video is part one of a two-part series. This video is going to be going over what Christoller Central Place Theory is and how it can be used for us to locate services within society. Part two will go over Christoller Central Place Theory, but how it can be used actually in urban geography and how it explains the organization of settlements throughout society. So make sure you check out both of the videos. Also, while watching these, make sure to use the guided notes. You can find them in the description below. The guided notes go along with the video and they'll help you better understand all of the content. Now, enough of me explaining all this, let's actually get into Christoller and what this whole theory is and how it works with the world today. The central place theory was created in the 1930s by German geographer Walter Christoller. In the 1950s, it was further developed. But this model and this theory really looks at where you should locate a service to have the most profitability. This model is still used today. Companies use this theory to better understand where they should locate and how profitable a location could be. Now we're gonna explain throughout this video all the different aspects of it. And the first thing that we're gonna to have to get into is a market area and this hinterland. Now in thinking of markets, think of it like a nodal region. Markets are areas that pull people in. At the center then is going to be our service. This is where people are going to be coming to. Now, there's a couple things with human behavior that we have to understand when looking at this theory. One, that people always are going to want to go to the closest area. You are going to interact with things that are closer to you compared to things that are farther away. That makes sense. It's kind of common sense, actually. You're not going to drive to a McDonald's that's an hour away if you can go to one that's 10 minutes away. You'll go to the closer market there. So that's this pull. And what we start to see is actually patterns start to form as companies provide services that pull people into these markets. Now, markets are these central places, and we're gonna pull up a picture of them in just a second, so that way you can kind of see a visual of it. But it's important to understand that when we're talking about markets, we're talking about this area that is pulling consumers in to be able to shop and purchase items. On the screen right now, you can see a very basic market. Now, in the center, I have Chipotle. So Chipotle would pull everyone who's in this circle towards it. Chipotle is pulling them in. This circle is actually our market area or the hinterland. Both of these are referencing the same thing. It's going to be important to understand it. Anyone who is within this circle is actually in the market area for Chipotle. So they are being drawn to Chipotle. People within the circle will, if they're going to go get Chipotle, will go to this location. And people outside of this circle, well, they would not be part of this market area. And they're gonna be pulled in a different direction. And that's important to understand. Now for the central place theory, we're not gonna be using circles. In fact, we're not using squares either. The central place theory uses hexagons for the actual kind of model when laying it out in the real world. And it's important to understand why. Here we can see we have circles, we have squares, and we have hexagons. All of these are set up to try and show what the central place theory would look like with these shapes. Now with circles, we can actually see a couple of things. One, I can see there's a gap between some of these circles. They don't all line up. And what that would mean is if you lived in that gap, well, you wouldn't have access to certain services. You'd have no access at all. And that's not true in real life. In the United States today, for example, everyone has access to services. Now, some people live further away, and so it will take them longer to get to certain services than others. However, we still have access to these services. The other issue with circles, too, is there's overlap. This would show that people are being drawn to two places at the same time, and that just doesn't necessarily happen. Now, the other issue too, when we're getting to squares, is we can actually see that squares do line up. That's a positive. On the other hand though, it's not equidistant from all of the center points, and that becomes an issue. And that's actually where the hexagon came in to be. Where here, Christoller thought at least, that the hexagon was a compromise that this was one lined up, so everyone was in a service area. And while it's not perfect for the exact distance between all the areas from the center, it's less variations and it was better. 
and hexagons actually played pretty well in the real world. And we're going to actually see the hexagons come back in part two. And it'll make more sense in that video when we're seeing how settlements are organized. So make sure to remember kind of why hexagons were picked when you're watching the next part of this video. Now that we understand why we're using hexagons, let's go back to our market area and hinterland. We're now going to talk about how we actually find how large or small that area will be. So on the screen here, I have my hexagon and I can see I still have Chipotle in the middle. The question is though, how would a company figure out how large or small this hexagon should be? How do they know their pull factor? Well, we have to take into account a couple of different things. One, we are not going to just use the distance to travel. Now, there's a reason why, and it actually is pretty simple. Think of actually how you process information when it comes to traveling somewhere. Now, your maps on your phone will say, oh, this is how many miles it is, and this is how far you'll be driving, but most people just care about the time. We are going to find this by understanding how far people are willing to travel through how long they're willing to go, because time is an easier metric for us to use. So when you're talking with your friends, normally when you're deciding where to go, you're not necessarily focused just on how long the trip is going to be with miles, but you're more focused on how long the time is. And there's a variety of reasons for that. If I want to go to Chipotle and there's multiple Chipotles in town, I'm going to go to the one that is the quickest for me to get there. Let's say I have a Chipotle that's only five miles away from me. And I have another Chipotle that's 10 miles away from me. The Chipotle though that's five miles away from me is going to have to go through the downtown area and it's traffic. The one that's 10 miles away, I could just quick hop on an interstate and drive right up to it. And it'll be a lot quicker for time. However, it's double the distance. I'm going to pick the one that's double the distance. I want to save my time. I'm not going to try to go through downtown. I'm not going to go through rush hour. So we make decisions based on our quickest route, not necessarily the shortest route. And that's important to understand. Another factor that people consider when trying to decide how long they should go to drive to a location is the type of service. Now, the more specialized something is, the more we're willing to drive to it. That's why you're going to see these professional sports stadiums, a very specialized service located in a larger area. But their market area, their hinterland is going to be very large. They're going to have a huge pull factor. People will be willing to drive there because it is such a unique experience. However, they're not going to have the same for, let's say, a Subway or a Chipotle or a McDonald's. Those are very common. And so in areas then where we are going to have a large amount of time required to drive to different spots, we're going to see more of those services. Think about it this way. If we actually look at your downtown, pull up Google Maps, type in subway. See how many subways pop up where you have congested roads or where it takes a long time to go through it. I bet there's probably a lot. However, when you start to move out a little bit and maybe you look at areas that are more spread out and so it's quicker to drive, there'll be less subways because what happens there is the time has changed. So in areas where it takes a lot to go down the street, well, you're going to have more subways popping up because they need to try and capture their market area. They know that people won't drive that far for it. So they put more in an area that takes a lot of time to travel in and less in an area where it's quicker. Now, range isn't the only thing that companies use to understand where they should put their locations. Threshold is another important factor. Threshold is just looking at the people within our market area, within this hinterland. Again, I can see here I have my hinterland and my market area and inside of it are people. Now these are going to be my consumers. Every location needs a certain amount of people to be able to support it. Now companies use census data to better understand who is within their market area. And it's important for them to know what types of people are there. Chipotle is an example that caters to more of a broad audience. But if I wanted to, let's say, open up a chiropractor, I want to make sure that I have an older population that would be willing to go there. If it's a very youthful population, maybe it'd be better if I opened up a nightclub or maybe a movie theater, depending on the age ranges there. All of these play into a role into a company's decision. So our threshold is determined by looking at the census data and the demographics within it's important for the company to know about. This lets them have a good understanding of who's in this region that's going to be drawn to their services. If they notice that hey, this market area works, the range is good, 
but the demographics within don't match up with our company, they'll locate in a different area. Or if they decide to still locate there, they won't be able to get enough people to support that store and they'll end up closing. And that will provide other issues down the road. Make sure you check out my next part now, which is going to look at the central place theory again, but now it's going to be applying it to actually the organization of settlements within society. I'm Mr. Sin. I hope this video helped you better understand Christoller central place theory and the location of services. Make sure to subscribe on your way out and check out part two of the video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time online.